Okay, so thank you for joining us today. For anyone in the audience that's not familiar with you, can you tell us a little bit about who you are, what you've been doing, and what you're going to talk to us about today? Sure. My name is Nadia Zhuksimbaeva. You don't need to worry about my last name. My daughter is 13 and she still doesn't pronounce it. Um, she starts, tries to stay away from it. Um, I am a recovering academic. Like any addiction, you never quite recover. You keep going back to teaching or to research. I was a professor of strategy and change until about uh, mid 2000s when one of my students, because I taught only in executive education, so only to practice in managers, one of my students said, well, all of this sounds great and interesting, but I don't think it actually works in life. Uh, would you walk the talk and join the company uh, for a project? So I founded a reinvention agency, which celebrates 10 years this year in June. And what we do is we help companies deal with the waves of change by reinventing their products, services, sometimes their processes, sometimes their entire business model. It really is client by client basis. I also write books. I have one daughter and one cat and one wonderful husband. I live in Ohio. All right. So let's talk about reinvention since you brought that up first. We're going to start there. So. Larger companies obviously probably have departments and marketing firms and they can help a little bit with that in research and strategy. If we're talking to a medium size or a small size business owner that's maybe a little overwhelmed um, and they realize they have to adapt, you know, you're watching the big box stores and these bigger companies come in, but where do they start? You know, they probably don't have that kind of help and maybe they don't have that insight. So if I'm, if I'm accepting the fact that, yeah, I do need to change regularly <laughs> and I do need to adapt, how do I figure out where that starts and what that looks like? So I will tell a little bit of kind of research and philosophy behind it, and uh, there will be good news in the middle of it, which is small and medium business. I am a small and medium business owner, uh, depending on which company in the portfolio. Small and medium business is actually more ready and more, um, uh, how do you say, uh, they're, they're more open or probably more uh, equipped to deal with change than big companies. I mainly work with big companies, and every time I work back with a small business, I am um, impressed with how easy the project is going because the reality is that big business is like a Titanic. It's very hard to move around an iceberg and you end up crashing into it. Even the best of the best, if you think about Kodak uh, that owned about 98% of film market or Nokia that owned um, about 40% of telecom business, if those two companies and many, many others were crashing in a matter of uh, less than two years. You can imagine that for a big company, it's really hard to turn around. For small business, um, uh, the issue is mindset. The issue is um, staying attuned to the reality that this is the new business as usual. What I mean by that is that um, when we grew up in the 20th century, well, at least when I grew up in the 20th century, um, that's my real of age right there. Um, the reality was very stable. So the business, even though there were some ups and downs, downs, sometimes we would face a crisis like the 70s oil crisis. But generally speaking, the reality was very, very smooth. And the transitions and reinventions, generally speaking, did not happen very often. Um, for example, for a fax machine, the fax technology did not change for 150 years until it became mass produced. Compare that to uh, Facebook that is updating itself every few years now every year or Apple or anything else that is happening now. So the main thing is to realize that you have to update yourself on average between two and five years, every two and five years. That's the number one is to be very, very attuned to when is it time and the signs are Either your customers are asking for something new or you are seeing a slight movement in the revenues or increase in the costs. You have some signal inside your business that it's time. I know for my business, it's been very consistent about every three years. We have to either put a new approach to, for example, this year we're going digital or we need to come up with a new product or something that gives us a boost. Then where do you start? You start by realizing what is your strength. What is that you're not interested in changing or you don't think should be changed? And many of us think of strengths as something like positive movement and let's all meditate and have yoga practices and we will find strength. Not like that. <laughs> you go 
back to very basic, you look around your business model, whether it, uh, it can be a product, that could be your strength. Sometimes it's not a product. Sometimes it's a unique skill. Maybe you have a co couple of employees or yourself who have something very unique to offer and you can package it differently. I often tell a story. I lived in Europe for 10 years and I met this amazing company that was in a tiny community uh, up in the mountains that was almost out of business. They were producing and installing heating and cooling equipment. And they were, the entire city was dependent on them. In 2004, they said, okay, we have to do something or the whole city will die because we're losing business to Chinese and to the uh, high branded West. So we have to do something. And they looked around and they had teams, small teams, two, three people, a couple of teams looking around the, all of their parts of business. And one of the teams said, well, one thing we do very well is electric motors because inside the heating and cooling system is electric motor. Can we sell that skill to somebody else? In 2005, they joined, they introduced their first automotive part uh, because automotive sector was in desperate need for knowledge of electric motors. And today they supply to every single major brand you can imagine. So if you take BMW, Audis, Renaults, Ford, all of them now have their parts. So you start by realizing what do I do great and where can I apply that in a new and different way. That's great. So that's a, like an internal way to look at it. Do you find any value in maybe like keep asking your customers what they want, you know, on a regular basis? Maybe do survey customers, do you ask them questions, you know, so from the customer side you can see. Absolutely. The trick here is that if you ask the customer what they want, they will give you either very generic answer or an answer that is actually not true. And it's not that they're lying to you. They're not. Just they, they were caught off guard and they're trying to make something very intelligent and smart. And uh, a much better source of information is actually visiting your customer in their real life and see what's going on. So if you have a chance to, instead of asking what do you need, is to ask them what's going on, how's the business going, what's new, where do you think it's going in the future. You will notice things that they probably don't yet realize are relevant for you. Maybe they're moving their product to a different format and you might be able to offer something around it. Maybe they're thinking of opening a new location and you might be able to deal with that. Maybe something else is going on in their organization and their processes and you can offer something there. But if you just ask them, what do you want? They will start making up stuff. And um, many of them also cannot imagine what is that that you have to offer. So um, Steve Jobs was famous for saying that um, people didn't think they need iPad. They couldn't even imagine that product. So if you ask them, do you need an iPad or what do you need? They would not generate an idea for an iPad because they simply don't recognize that there is a latent need there. So I often travel to my customers. I try to sit on their meetings if they let me. Uh, I try to sit um, um, for coffee shops. I love toilets and coolers because this is where you really hear what's going on. So I show up and very quietly listen to what's going on. And then you have ideas. You have this new things that come to your mind. How about we do this? How about we do this? And uh, you get insight that is probably more precise. Another source of information is also suppliers or customers of your customers. We often uh, not realize how interconnected we all are. So if this is Let's say this is the supply chain and there is supplier, supplier, and this is one of you. And then your customer and their customer, customer, customer. Sometimes a trigger here can change life for all of them, but we don't recognize it on time. So having a chance, and you don't need to be kind of religious about it. As long as you have reminders in your phone every quarter, it's time to check in with somebody outside of my shell. That's about it. Put the reminder in. I, I always say I will do it until it's in my schedule. Yeah, it's, you know, vision without action is hallucination. Until it's in your schedule, you're hallucinating. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And, you know, I think there's an old Tony Robbins quote. He's like, you can sit around thinking good thoughts all day and people take your furniture. You know, if you don't absolutely. Know. Absolutely. I mean, it's a wonderful dream. I mean, you're daydreaming. Great. But until it's your schedule. So you literally just as you're listening to it, pull up a phone, put a reminder in three months. I need to check in with someone outside of my shop. That's it. That's all you need to do is just to have. And when you get that beep in September, you will be like, what is this? I don't even remember what this is. And you will take a little bit of time to remember and then you will realize. And there, there is a, there's a different pattern when you start getting outside of your comfort zone. That's great. And maybe it even becomes like a habit. Yeah, actually. I hope so. Yeah.
I hope so. Great. Okay, so I know another big thing you're working with is sustainability yeah. and how that yeah. helps businesses and helps things. So from a, a small business, you know, kind of similar question, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'd imagine real estate companies are seeing, you know, the, the prices of the, the commodities go up, food businesses, small margins. If I'm that small business and I'm kind of caught up in the, yeah, my costs are going up, but I have no idea how to address how a sustainability model might help that. Where would I start with that? Like, where's the first place I might look at? Where do I come up with some ideas? Yeah. The first place to look is always cost saving. So um, my mantra around sustainability is pretty straightforward. Um, many times we think about sustainability and these different associations come to mind. Save the area, climate change, all kinds of different policies. And all of those are important uh, unless you start touching yourself and you realize, okay, um, how does that translate to my direct existence? And then suddenly sustainability becomes very different. So what is happening with sustainability is we need to peel it back to the reality of sustainability, yeah, ability to sustain. And the ability to sustain in your business might be very different than the ability to sustain in my business. Uh, but the first place to start is always low-hanging fruit around cost savings. If you take a very intelligent look around your processes, around your office, around your life, you will notice places where you are wasting resources. You're, you're wasting resources naturally just because um, um, this is just the way you did business. I will give you an example. We were working with a very small factory in Ohio, and their latest shift, their evening shift, night shift, was working at the far end of this big well, not big, like a barn-looking production factory. And because the shift was working at the end, they had to light the whole barn for the whole time for them to be safe to walk there and back. Uh, so just move around locations and you will save a huge amount of money on uh, electricity bill. That's what I mean, start with cost. See where you're wasting costs. Another question I ask when I'm speaking to the audience, how many of you spent 100% of your time at your workplace? Uh, nobody says I do. <laughs> it's about 90 then you ask majority, and majority today is spending somewhere around 50, 60, unless you are customer facing, so you're standing in front of a customer, then you're spending most of the time there. But the reality is most of us still think about every employee needs to have a desk, needs to have a location, every employee needs to be in a prescribed cubicle, and for that, you are still paying real estate costs, heating and cooling, everything you can imagine around it. So do you really need that many offices or that, that much space if nobody's really sitting? Or is there a way of organizing your office that is smaller, probably doesn't require as much resources in terms of saving on heating and cooling and, by the way, CO2 emissions? I know this is very heated conversation. If you're not interested in uh, saving CO2 emissions, it may not be what drives you. Start with energy efficiency. I'm sure you're interested in energy efficiency. So what's happening now is that sustainability stopped being the enemy of business and actually is becoming a huge driver of innovation in business because customers are demanding to see what's happening with you, but also your suppliers and your cost structure is demanding that you begin to think about, okay, what's happening with the resource base? What's happening with supplies? Why is my supplier giving me higher prices year after year? The answer is, is because we're running out of resources. You like it or not, most resources that needed, really needed in the world today are running out. And the ones that are not needed are also creating economic devastation. I mean, uh, being in your state, you know very well what happens when nobody needs coal. That's also for my country. I was born in Kazakhstan. We have some resources that companies really, truly need. Then we have others that are getting a huge crash of prices. And we have whole regions that are dying. The reality is it's not a one-time event. We are looking at major, at major restructuring of economy, and we need to adapt to that before it crashes us. We need to ride those waves before they completely overwhelm that. So sustainability starts with basics, which is where do I waste resources today? When I'm being resource dumb, <laughs> let me put it that way. And very often it's, um, it's um, a breakthrough innovation comes from that question. So I will give you an example. My favorite, favorite story of all times on the dumb resource waste is the idea of shampoo. There's a wonderful company uh, originally from UK, also small and medium business. 
that was producing regular shampoo. But one day they were looking at their books and of course the costs are creeping up and they had a question around what is the value that they're delivering when they're selling shampoo and they talk to their customers and so on. And the value is very simple, it's clean head. But what is a one resource that is always available on site to produce the result, which is clean head? And therefore it's absolutely unnecessary for success of shampoo. And that is water. Water is always, you cannot have a clean head without water inside, but we pump water, clean water, we produce plastic bottles, we bottle water, we transport water, we shelf water, we sell water, where water is completely unnecessary. So they played around and developed a dry shampoo, a very successful product. Um, my baby brother, whenever he comes to, he's not a baby, he's in his 30s, a very tall, but he's my baby brother. So when he comes to visit me, he says no dry shampoo for me, but he's the only one I know who has that reaction. It works wonderful. It has essential oils. It does everything it does. And the company is privately owned, so they don't release their financials. They don't say how much they're saving. But uh, on transportation costs, they did release the data. Transportation costs fell 15 times per wash. So it's just, sometimes it's just small things. Sometimes it's massive things like this. What is a part of our value proposition that is actually unnecessary? We're doing it because we've done this like this for the last 10 years, or we've always done it like this, or we're doing it because there's a custom, or we're doing it for some other reason. It might be packaging. It might be the way you organize your warehouse. It might be your office. It might be your supplies. What is unnecessary? It might be your time. You might be spending some of your time unnecessarily. That's where sustainability starts. It starts with guarding the resources and then later by producing even more innovative solutions that you have ever imagined. Um, do you find a lot of people have difficulty seeing that? Is it useful to bring in an outside eye, so to speak, sometimes? Or do you feel like you can sit back and be realistic about, are we doing things out of habit? You know, can we even notice that we're wasting time and space if we've been doing this so long? Absolutely. I mean, um, there are many different ways you can bring an external person. Uh, of course, first thing people think about is a consultant. And if you are really tight on budget and it's a difficult thing for you, you can imagine different things. For example, events like this is a place where you can grab somebody for a coffee and ask them, uh, can you give me some advice or what would be your take on this? Yeah, um, I sometimes bring my friends and colleagues from completely different professions. For example, when I have a project on metallurgy, I bring biologists or physicists or medical professionals because, you know, they ha they're smart people, but they have no shores. They, like, you know, they have not been like these horses that are protected, right? So they ask what they think are dumb questions. And for me, it's like, yeah, we haven't. You know, we assumed too many things. And because they ask basic questions, all the assumptions come out. And suddenly you see that, you know, the famous saying, the assumptions are mother of all, I don't want to cuss on TV, so a mother of all <clears throat> problems in the world. Yeah, so uh, you suddenly see a lot of assumptions coming out because you bring somebody. So if you have a friend who is in different profession, just spend 10 minutes structurally presenting the situation. This is what I'm doing right now. This is my challenge. And let them reflect on what they're noticing. Like they ask them questions uh, or they, they ask you questions or they tell you back what they're seeing. You might be surprised what you might get. And of course, uh, all kinds of events and associations and networks. Um, this is a place to see a different side of a story. Your first reaction will be very defensive. That's normal. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Um, we even do exercises where we put business owners um, with their back to the group as they're discussing the business owner problem because the business owner always wants to jump and explain how this opinion has already been there, try that, or this opinion is not going to work. It's a very difficult job for them to just sit and listen. But when you sit and listen, you um, digest um, the ideas. And it's not that you hear an answer from what you are listening to. You are stimulated from a different point of view and you yourself see something new. Not necessarily somebody will come and fix it for you, but they will bring a different perspective that will kind of unhinge something in this tangle situation of yours. That's great. Um, I'd like to go back to something you mentioned before with how you know, CO2 emissions is a conversation, sustainability is a conversation. So as a brand, as a business owner, do you find that there's a benefit 
once they figure that out to say, hey, we are doing this. We're conserving. Not only did we make some smart business decisions, but we're conserving water. We're conserving resources. We're conserving energy or time. Or, or is that because it's an issue, is that a double-edged sword? Well, it's really a personal conversation for every business. But what is the trend on the market happening today is that and I'm the first to say we are guilty why this is happening. I even, um, in my latest book, I wrote a chapter on uh, green is dead and how I personally contributed to the demise of the green as a scientist who wrote about it for many years. I think we've done, generally speaking, a very bad job um, communicating the essence of what sustainability is about. And also the word itself has a fundamental problem. In terms of, it's hard to make use it as an inspiring word. Yeah, you might have heard me already said it, but if you think of, um, let's say, you had a wonderful dinner on Friday night and you exit in a restaurant and you bumped in a neighbor of yours that used to live nearby and now moved away and you haven't seen each other for a couple of years and you're catching up. How's your life? How's job? How's your marriage? Sustainable. Yeah, the word is just. It doesn't have that amazing feeling like you don't want your marriage to be just sustainable hopefully uh, you want it to be amazing great exciting something you know through the roof and you don't want your business to be just sustainable you want it to be amazing exciting thriving and so on so the world has a problem and we have communicated in a way that we abused it to the point that it became mean everything and nothing at all so in that sense what we're seeing is that our customers are getting tired of this because sustainable became to me, now every time I ask an audience, what do you think about, when you think about green product or sustainable product or sustainable shoes, what do you expect? Number one, it will be overpriced. Number two, it will be underperforming. And number three, generally speaking, it will be ugly. So the normal apple is a beautiful apple, sustainable apple is like, little organic thing falling off the cliff. Yeah, and normal shoes will be beautiful designer shoes and sustainable eco shoes will be this rubber type of thing that hippies wear. Yeah, so this is the, maybe that's not correct. It's not about whether it is reflects in the reality. It's the perception and perception is very important. So we have done this. I'm not saying that this is something, um, you know, objectively correct and so on. We have created this on the market. So what is business doing now to deal with it? The business is putting out uh, a different brand around sustainability. Instead of speaking about green, they're speaking about smart. So you can see a lot of products talking about them being clever or being smart or business sense. Because this is basic smartness. You don't want to shoot yourself in the foot. You don't want to destroy your entire supply chain and then you're out of business. That's just being smart. You don't want to waste product or package on a thing that is zero value and tons of waste, tons of pollution, tons of CO2 emissions. It's just basic smart and tons of money as well. By the way, let's not, let's not shy away from the issue. If you don't have financial sustainability, you do not have sustainability, period. It's very simple. But the delay is how do we find the time, Yeah, the right time to introduce each thing? Because if you're, let's say, um, if you're going for a sustainable solution that doesn't have economics today, you will kill your company because your costs will be higher than your revenues. But if you don't introduce the sustainable solutions where the whole world already moved in that direction, you will be out of business because your competition will kill you. So you are stuck between this very sensitive time. Yeah, this On your time horizon, you need to find a place. Where is the time to start moving to the next best thing? And that, again, goes back to know your customers, know your supply chain, uh, know yourself, where are you wasting things, start practicing with your own um, resourcefulness and um, smart solutions, smart sustainable solutions. And then when you do that, it is much easier to present it to the customers because they don't think of it as a greenwashing. It's a very simple, straightforward, clear thing you're doing. You're being smart for yourself, you're being smart for them. And yes, part of that there's a financial benefit and environmental, social, every kind of benefit. So there's no reason to hide it um, in any way. Just tweak the positioning a little bit towards smart and kind. Um, so we're using a lot of the different words now that are a little bit less polluted as eco or sustainable or green. worried about adapting, if we're worried about sustainability, what's that one 
big thing you think any company needs to keep their eye on right now? I mean, obviously the internet has opened up all sorts of changes. We're much smaller and bigger at the same time now. Um, you talked about going digital. We're a digital marketing agency, so we know how quickly that part changes. Um, but the whole world and how it communicates changes. So if you're a business owner right now, what's the one thing you think pretty much every business needs to keep their eye on going forward? Um, it's hard to say one thing because it depends a little bit on which business. If you are in production, I would seriously think about water. Uh, water is a new oil. And um, many states like your state is not yet experiencing the water shortage like California does um, or Arizona does. But whatever state you will be in, uh, water is becoming a fundamental cost in the business and it will continue to transform in a way you cannot predict because the weather patterns how crazy is the season the weather pattern means that our access to even underground water is changing rapidly so this and we don't have enough understanding of where will we have shortage and where will we have so if you can start preparing your business if you're in production uh towards less and less water use and more and more smart water use collecting gray water, so the rain, um, uh, reusing the uh, water of the washing your hands into the toilet, stuff like that. If you start thinking in that direction, you will be prepared for challenges that are just about on the horizon right now. In service industry, I think the biggest issue that we're facing today is the clash of generations. You think you understand your customers, your customers in two years will be completely different than today because they are fundamentally, their mindset is fundamentally different. Many customers of the younger generation do not want to own anything. Remember our parents after the war and the grandparents after the war? Ownership was like, I made it in life, this is what American Dream is about. Today, not ownership is the coolest thing. If you can just not own anything, that means that thing doesn't own you. So in that sense, you positioning your ads, your offer about the old customer is almost laughable for the new customer. And they're coming up very quickly, so quickly. So in a matter of two to three years, what is your base can change fundamentally. And the same, of course, is happening in politics. You can see that already in next election, absolute majority uh, will be uh, just over age 18. So that generation is taking you over and their expectations of what you are to offer is very, very different. So this is the challenge right now is to understand how are you going to manage the transition? Because your old customers are still alive and they need you. And then there's new customers who want something completely different. They don't want to own. They are into sharing. So if they can use the uh, element of your service, but not own anything and be responsible for insurance and things and the whole thing. To the point that there is a wonderful company, exceptionally um, successful in, in Amsterdam right now, that leases jeans. You thought about Uber being <laughs> new? There are companies now that are doing Uber model for jeans. And the interesting thing, you don't actually use secondhand jeans. It's not like it's a secondhand shop. It is a method of bringing the customer back and bringing the raw material back because the hardest thing is to collect the raw material. That's where you spend most of the money is the collection. Just as distribution network is very expensive, collection network for your raw material base. And that's a competition for fast fashion. So instead of selling $100 or $50 jeans, you can sell five $5 per month and then get it back and re recycle it again and use it again. So this is fundamentally different things. We don't even fully understand how our, our younger generation thinks. My daughter, we all are on email, right? You got in touch with me through email. I love my email. My daughter is 13. She's been on every kind of device for last five, six years, she doesn't use email. She doesn't even understand why would you need email. Yeah, so she gets her information. She knows when she needs to do. She's very busy. She has many activities. She gets messages, right? She gets the, the information transfer happens. It just doesn't happen through email. She loves all these cloud sources. She's on uh, Google Drive and Google Doc, but she's not on email. So this is the fundamentally different patterns of behavior. And if you're in services, I would pay attention to what the ne next generation is needed. Great. Um, so I've obviously a lot of great information. Thank you. It was a great interview. Um, if our viewers want to keep up with you, obviously you have a couple books out. Where would you like? Uh, yeah, the out easiest is um, I started a new platform called ChiefReinventionOfficer.com. We're also on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter.
think wherever. Um, it is a free resource base. Uh, we put out starting mid June. We're putting out a new YouTube channel, so one new video per week with some nugget, something that will be triggering you towards reinvention. And my position is every single one of us needs to become a chief reinvention officer of our own life. If we get that right, we will figure out how to fix our companies, how to fix the economy, how to fix our community. So if we start with our own life and learn how to reinvent again and again, I'm sure we will survive whatever life throws at us. It's all about adaptation, right? That's the human condition, I guess. Thank you. It's a pleasure to connect and have an amazing conference and um, good luck to everyone. It's a tough time, but it's also a very exciting time. Let's take the best out of it. Bye. Bye. Bye.